Well, just put some hardware on it. Yeah. <laughs> just yeah. Well, <laughs> you you want to finish every edge nice, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. but but you don't need to spend hours and hours on each edge on a lot of the projects that you do. So that's right. Yeah. Well, Denny has brought in literally half of his tool rack uh, from his wall. He took down everything that had I to do, do with edging. I've got a bunch of empty loops. I will not know where anything goes. <laughs> You'll make it all new again. Yeah, it'll, it'll be, I it'll be all fresh. All over. That's right. <laughs> you can lay it out if anything was bothering you before you can fix it now. Yeah. <laughs> Chance. All right. And I actually, so this is the sheet that I, I think I showed you guys a knife on Friday, I believe, or maybe it was last Wednesday. I, I think I had a picture on my phone because I'm not going to bring yeah, that thing I think here. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Um, Denny was, was a little sad this morning when I said, no, I didn't bring the knife. <laughs> But anyways, I did. Uh, I've got my sheath all sewn up. I've got it all finished, and I am ready to edge this today. I have been sanding just kind of continually for like the last half hour um, on my edges just to get them kind of smoothed out. So I'm just going to kind of tootle around on this while we talk about things today. Yeah. And if you guys have any questions, let me know. Did you want to show your... Yeah, you can. Isn't that gorgeous, you guys? Liz is pretty handy. We were talking about it before. We were, I was like, man, your edge looks nice and sanded. And she's like, yeah, I got a lot more sanding to do. Yeah. I got some more to yeah. do. I have it all because I just sewed it up last night. And so typically what I'll do is um, I'll have my front panel. Luna. I'll have my front panel cut out. I'll glue my welt on. Um, I might sand it up a little bit just to make sure if I've got anything a little bit funky before I, I draw my stitch line. Um, I'll get that all evened up and then I will chisel out my holes. I'll glue my back on. And this was, I had this one hole right here cause I had sewn this previously, the, this upper section that's open. So that was already sewn. So I had this one hole that I could stick my needle through and make sure that was lined up completely. Um, and then I glued everything together and then I took it back out to the, the grinder and I sanded it the rest of the way down. Um, to get a pretty, to make sure that, you know, my, my back edge was where I wanted it so I could score my line there. And then I just started sewing one hole yeah. at a time. Yeah. Took well, it me was great. most of last night. <laughs> Everything fits really nice. Everything flows together really good. I really like the way you, you did the back. Everything just goes together. Oh, thanks. That was, that was tricky. Yeah. I stared at that for a while. So I have these two, I punch oblong slots where my belt loop is and they go all the way out to the edge to kind of secure that but the knife handle goes up to probably about here so I just wanted to give it a little bit of extra I don't know I mean this knife is probably not going to be used all that much is what I'm assuming or you know if you were to use a huge buoy like this you're probably going to be in some like renaissance outfit dressed up for you know the medieval jousting so you might have a big wide belt on that you need to hang your your knife sheath from I don't know. Either no. that or the apocalypse has already hit and we're back in medieval times. Exactly. <laughs> and then it doesn't matter whose knife it was. You're going to use it because you got it. And <laughs> it's sharp. <laughs> but, all righty. Okay. So let's start with the, what's okay. the first? Most, mostly what we're going to talk about here today is, is a single ply leather. Although what you're doing, you know, you have multiple plies there, in, but it all works the same. I have many the, plies. The main difference is going to be the size of the beveler that you use and the style of beveler. Mm-hmm. And oh, Denny, people... that's question. What size beveler do I use <laughs> all the time? Yeah. Well. Whatever size you want, guys. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll talk about it <laughs> continually for the next hour yes. about what size you use. I love it. But, uh. Most people cut their eye teeth on a bevel. I know I did on a bevel like this. This is an old Osborne 127. Tandy used to sell a, a similar product to this. Uh, you know, we sell a, a similar product to, to this that we mm-hmm. have made. But but these are all uh, Osborne tools. And uh, this is a number. Let me start with a really big Denny, why don't you come here? Okay. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Necessary. Yeah, that's good. Okay. We'll start with a really big beveler. This is a number four, and I believe this is the largest size that uh, we stock in this beveler. And for this single ply, this is about 10 ounce leather. 
This is a little bit too much of an edge because you, you've taken a little more than half of the leather off on the actual edge here. Okay. So <clears throat> most people would use this as like a, a single ply strap, like a belt or a, a bridle piece or a, a purse handle, you know, something like that. I personally would use probably a number two in this style of beveler. Well, and yeah, and that's one thing to also keep in mind is that every style of beveler, your sizing is different. Yeah, it's going to be a little different. And and you can buy probably two of these same bevelers, two number two bevelers, mm -hmm. and they will they will do a little different. Plus, the more you sharpen this beveler, the, the bigger it's going to mm -hmm. get. So a number two can end up like a number three or a number four. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> it, it will. Yeah. It will. Okay. But to, this number two takes off just about right for me on a on a ten ounce belt like this, because I would I would bevel both sides of this, and that's that's just a nice round edge that you end up with there. Yeah. But, uh, also, if you wanted to, if you're doing something really fine, a real thin leather. Here's a thin piece. This is probably a seven to eight ounce. And you go down to like a number one beveler on this, this style. You know, that's what I would want to use here. Because you want to, you actually want to round over probably a third of the way through your leather. If you go all the way to a half, you will actually end up with a, where am I? Right here. You will actually, instead of a, a round edge, you will actually end up with a point. Okay. If you go halfway through, right? If you if you bevel half of that, and a lot of people say I would really like a beveler that that bevels a round edge. They don't do that, right? You know, because even if you have even if you have a, we have different bevelers here, and I will show you, but it will be ground round, but it will actually give you a flat cut. Okay. You know, but when you burnish, that's right. Edge, when you take... that's what turns it round, right? You know, so it just depends on how how much you want to burnish as to how nice and round you get your edge. Okay. You know, and and we'll show you how to burnish here in a little bit too. But anyway, okay. that's, so that's all I want to say about these. So those are the 127s? These, these, these are the 127s. Okay. And like I said, we sell, you know, here is, I brought our catalog here. Ooh -hoo. And we sell comparable tools to that. This Craftmaster is about the same. Beveler. Oh, yep. Yeah. Yeah. And this this standard edge beveler that we have here is about the same type this of is, beveler. This is the one that I have at home. Um, oh, that, that uh, uh, set? No, I'm sorry. This is the one I have at home. This five-in-one because it has five different sizes. Or, yeah. And I I love it. So this is the one I have. Mine is the old style that has everything housed in the handle instead of an extra tube. But I like it. Yeah. It's that's the one I use. Well, there again, and and I, I harp on this every time we talk about any kind of tool. The main thing is keep them sharp. Get them sharp and keep them sharp. Yeah. And you can make any of them work for you. Yeah. But next, we have this new one, and this is, these are the tools that really excited me when we first started getting them. Uh, these are Od made by Odin. Uh, we call them our. Uh, SLC Pro Bevelers, mm -hmm. and these are a little more pricey than than some of the other bevelers, but boy, do they <laughs> cut good right out of the package. This is the largest that we stock. We have five different sizes, a one through five, and this is a number five, and it does about the same thing as a number two in that one yep. twenty seven. They're much fi much finer yeah. bevelers, a fine. But boy, I don't know if you guys saw how nicely. Easily that cut. Woo wee! I mean, <laughs> makes Denny happy. Yeah, it, it will bring a smile to your face when you do <laughs> these things. But to, like I say, we got them in five different sizes. If you're a, if you're using a, like a, a thin oil tan leather, let me see, like this. This is about a what? What is it? About a four to five ounce or a three or? A, hey, guess what? Yeah, four. Yep. Yeah, I'm going to use this number two beveler on it and show you what it'll do. I mean, look at, look at this. Look at that little hair. Yeah, <laughs> but that's about perfect for this leather here. 
We can even go smaller to this number one. It's barely taking you off anything. You're talking about a hair. Yeah. Now that is a hair. <laughs> but these things cut so nice. If you have a set and someone tries to use them, just... Shoo them away. Hit them with a hammer. Hit them with a hammer. Yeah. Hammers are handy tools, too. That's <laughs> so sharp, just poke right through your bag there. Yeah. Bill, we're, I did we're this in Springfield, so I can Missouri. Keep everything straight. What's that? I don't know. Bill said Springfield where? So Springfield, Missouri. All right. Okay. Next beveler. These are what we call a Western style beveler, and these are mostly for a heavier type leather. I was gonna say they're they're gonna take off a chunk. They well, they take off a chunk. Plus, they've also uh, let me see. They've also got a real wide flange on each side of the cutting edge you know so mm -hmm. so if you're like trying to bevel this you can't get to it because of that flange that uh, that flange holds, yeah. the, holds the beveler up off the table too far yeah but uh, if you're going for this type of leather here you can do it almost this is a number two i think i've got a number one here yeah this one will probably work but you're better off using these on a heavier leather, like that, and they work really well. I mean, you can really, you can do some heavy duty work with these with these bevelers. Mm -hmm. What is the number? Of, we got a number four. Is the yeah, biggest? number four is the biggest we have. I've got a piece of heavy harness leather, probably fourteen to sixteen ounce, and that's what it'll do. You know, and that's that's just about right for that yeah. piece of leather. Yep, you do the back side, and that's yeah. going to be just about perfect. Yeah, you can do the back side. I'll Look show at that. You. That's, a, that's a nice beveler, too. Yeah. I'll show you something else you can do with a beveler like this and this heavy leather. I've already, one side of this is already beveled because I cut it off of it. You're going to make existing. that round, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> you, you can make a piece of square leather round. What would you do with this? I don't know. <laughs> what do you what do you do with a piece of round leather? You can use it for a piece of heavy lace, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, a lot of times when I was making a, a lot of uh, roping reins, people wanted a closed rein, but they wanted it round. You can uh, stitch two pieces of heavy leather together and and like make a half inch strap and bevel a big heavy edge mm. on each side and you've almost got a round ring then you saddle soap it real good and you can rub it like this and, and it'll turn around well, there you go yeah huh okay now we've talked about those with your soc pro bevelers you've had yours for a minute have you sharpened them any uh i've stropped them a time or two i have never sharpened them yeah. uh but uh it just depends if you use them. If you use a tool, it's going to need to be uh, at least dropped. Yeah. You know. Now, if you don't use it, it can just sit on your bench, and it doesn't yeah. matter. Yeah, it'll yeah. stay sharp forever or <laughs> dull forever, whichever. Whichever. Hey Tony, can you come over here to Facebook and click the new comments for me? Okay. <clears throat> Next, we've got what they call a common edger. I always call these fork edgers because they look just like a fork. You can see those, and uh, they work basically the same way as a western edger, but they will take even a little more off. I used to use this type of edger a lot when I did a when I on a the fork cover on a saddle. If I did a, a welt on it, mm -hmm. and it was a raw welt, just a single piece of leather. You can actually trim with this. Oh, oh. Uh, let's do that here. There we go. You can actually trim with this. You know. Oh, huh. Yeah, you can yeah. cut right in. Yeah. And it makes a nice round cut there. Oh, it sure does. Yeah. But to... Uh, Hold on, I can't see your round cut. Oh. Well, I'm sorry you can't see my round cut. But it is round. Take our word for it, you guys. That's <laughs> round. That's round. But you can use this the same way as any other beveler, you know, just use the proper size, you know, for the proper type of leather that you're working on. It'll just take a regular edge off. 
You know so those are the common edgers. I think that they look like snake's tongues. Snake tongue one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's what Snake tongue edgers. Yeah. Next time you ask me for my snake tongue edger, I'll know which one to grab. All right. Now we've got, this is a tight corner edger. Yes, it is. Right here. It's also similar to this, how would you pronounce that? The bisonette. Bisonette. A bisonette edger, which is a push-pull type edger. It will, uh, it's similar to a western edger, only you can, only instead of a, instead of a, a fork, it's it just got a round hole ground in it. Mm -hmm. And you can, this edger will work when you push it. Or when you pull it. Well, Joe, look at that. Yeah. Looks like it does a little bit better when you pull it. Well, it just depends. Yeah. yeah. It, it depends on the angle that you hold it. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes a little practice to work one of these in both directions. Now, don't we have a straight one and a bent one? Uh, no. That's what we have in, in this. The uh, western. This western. Gotcha. Edge. We have a straight shank and a, and a, and a bent shank. I really can't ever tell the difference in how they work myself. Yeah. I've got a couple of each. I use them all and don't know the difference. Okay. You know? I just pick them up and use them. But anyway, that's what this uh, bisonet edger does. Now, this tight corner edger is made the same way. It's just got, got a hole in the center of it, but uh, the end of it is built bent at a really sharp angle. So you can uh, actually get in and uh, I don't know if we've got anything I can punch a big enough hole with. Mm. Uh, I should have kept that slot on. It might even edge this. Let's see. Mm. I will say that that little beveler still didn't like, I, I took it home to try to do my inlays and like up in this little corner up here where it was just this teeny little niche, it still wasn't super happy and I just had to get my sandpaper in there yeah, and sand it down. Yeah, or you can use an X-Acto knife and just, just uh, trim that, trim that one edge. Denny, I just need you in my house with me while I'm trying to make things. Because <laughs> you don't answer your phone. <laughs> You know, I don't know why, but I keep my phone on silent. So I do too. I and then I can't, I can't even feel it when it vibrates. <laughs> my wife tried to call me twice the other day, and she was almost hacked off because I didn't answer the phone. I said, I didn't know you were calling. <laughs> okay, but anyway, I just made a small hole in this leather, and this will actually edge that hole. Look at it go. It sure did. Now it did kind of leave a divot. As you go around. Well. But then here's the deal with this style of beveler, guys. We we don't sell it. Um, I did ask Barry King. Hello. Look, we have visitors. Luna. Kevin. Luna, come here. Well, I just wanted to show hey, these. Luna. These nice come here. Here. Luna. Hey, hello. Where all the weird stuff happens. This this is where weird stuff happens, and it's happening right now. This is Denny. Hello. A lot of these right now? Yep. She, she is our uh, all around person who does everything. Thanks, Kevin. I think that's. She's a master. Hello, <laughs> this is our barky little dog. You guys want to move this one? Hello. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi, guys. <laughs> We're just doing a, an edging video today. You're what? We're doing an edging video today. How to do edges. I'm going to show them how to sharpen edges again a little bit. And we're also going to use some different products on finishing the edges. What a great idea. Yeah. Okay, bye. Bye. See you, Kevin. Okay. Intermission for some yeah. visitors. Yeah, that like, happens. Like we do, you guys know. You guys come visit us, we'll do the same thing. That's for you. right. <laughs> Alrighty, so you were talking, oh, um, so this specific beveler, uh, when we were in Dallas this year, I asked Barry King, I was like, hey, can we carry these? 
Um, and he said, sure, you can buy them at the price that everybody else can buy them for and sell them more expensively because we don't wholesale those because his guys hate making them. Yeah. So in any case, if you are looking for a bent nose beveler, um, you can order them through Barry King. I believe that they are $60, $70, somewhere in that yeah. range. Um, or this specific one is a horseshoe brand, which is Jeremiah Watt. Um, and you can order it through his website. Yeah. Yeah. We used to get them from Weaver, I believe, but I don't know that Weaver's selling them anymore. Yeah, I, I they're probably, I feel like this is the point, Jeremiah, they're just going to make them and, and sell them themselves because they are pretty complicated yeah. to uh, to produce. Yeah, but they're really nice. You know, if you do a lot of knife sheaths or holsters with a with a belt slot in them, mm -hmm. that's where they really come into their yeah. own because you can bevel the inside, that little inside corner of those slots with them. People love them. All right. Hopefully that answers your question, Michael. Yeah, Michael, we don't we don't carry them. Yeah, we do not. But what we do is make a mess on the table. That's all right. Yeah. I took out the trash yesterday. There's room for yours. Okay. We've we've pretty much covered the types of bevelers that we have. Okay. That uh, that most people will have and use. Uh, Next, should we talk about finishing the edges, burnishing edges? Yeah, do you want to talk about just like the edge prep, like how to how to get your edge going? What's up? Well, before we get before we get to that, we talked a little bit about them, but maybe stylizing your edge just a little bit with the creaser or doing the creaser and letting it bread if you see yeah, the machine. Stays. I'm going to talk about that here in a minute oh, okay. but, and how to use the creaser and what they will do for you. But uh, when you use a creaser, you they only it really only works on a vegetable tan leather. Unless because, you have a heated one yeah. that you can do cuz there are the sets that you can buy with the heated creasers that you can use on like your handbags and stuff. I've seen a lot of that. I see. Yeah. yeah. But as far as a hand a hand creaser uh, what they're good for, I'll show you here in a minute. Okay. Yeah. So uh, just like as far as like prepping your edge for a good finish. Yeah. Like that's because you can't just like there's a lot of work that goes into getting that really nice edge. Um it's not just uh I'm gonna bevel and then put some gum trag on it. Yeah, yeah. Gum trag is good. Yes. Gum trag is is a I good edge finish, but uh, there's more process to go through before you get to that point. Mm -hmm. Most people on a single ply belt, and I've got this <laughs> tight corner edger, but I'm going to use it anyway because it'll work very well. Michael, I, I believe I've seen them called a, a tight corner edger or a bent nose edger. I, I believe I've seen them both ways. But honestly, like if you go to Barry King's website, he only has, you know, a small amount of, of bevelers. And yeah. so it should be pretty easy to find. Yeah. But but I've got this. If I wanted a really fine edge, I would <clears throat> I would take a piece of sandpaper. Can I of course. one of these? It, because when you, after you bevel, it roughs up the edge quite a bit. So if you take a fine sandpaper and sand this, after it's beveled, it's already got that uh, that corner knocked off. But I now <clears throat> that's all I would do to this one myself mm -hmm. before I before I burnish the edge. But then I would take uh, after it's sanded. Do you this, find do you find it any different going one way or going both going both ways with your sandpaper? Do you find it any different? I don't. I don't. But that depends on the piece of leather. A, a piece of leather with some loose grain in it will have a, a direction to the grain. Mm -hmm. So you want to go, uh, you don't want to go against the grain because you will be roughing it up every time. Mm -hmm. So if you if you come the, the same direction of the grain, I guess you will have a better yeah. outcome. I typically find that like if I'm taking off a lot of material, like if I'm trying to sand edges and get, I have multiple edges and get them all together, I'll go both ways. But when I get to my final finishing and I'm doing my final sanding to lay everything down, I will just go one direction. I will go towards like the bottom of whatever I'm doing and lay it all down one way. Yeah. And honestly, I don't know if 
that's good or bad or well, or if it's necessary or not, but it it makes it feel good. I don't know. Yeah, if it if it works for you, that's exactly the way to do right? it. Right. But but if you're if you're sanding a piece of leather and it and it fuzzes up behind the sander every time, mm -hmm. try sanding the other direction. Okay. You know. Well, and also one thing to note is that if you are dealing with a pretty loose grain leather, it's never going to lay down well yeah. for you. Yeah, loose loose grain leather comes from down low on the hide, down around mm -hmm. the belly or the flank or something. And so the higher up on the hide that you go, the firmer the leather will be, the nicer it will be to, to cut and yeah. to... Well, and also you can see it. So it. if you are in a situation where you have a lot of layers lined up, uh, like for me, when I cut this welt out, the back of the leather that I cut it from was quite flanky. And I took um, a French edger before I glued everything together and I edged like I skived all of that flank off as much as I could because that was going to make my my edge seem loose yeah. like with that flanky material it would be more prone even after I glued it to pull apart um than if I had if I didn't take it down to where that that grain was nice and tight yeah which is another reason why Herman Oak is so amazing because a lot of times you'll see with like your import veggies that are tanned <laughs> in the in the faster tanning method they have even across the whole hide they will have a looser grain to them and the Herman Oak is tanned in in the manner to where that grain is just super tight all the way through the hide. Yeah, it's, it sets the grain mm -hmm. on the leather. Yeah, which allows you to finish it a lot nicer. Yeah. What grain or what grit of sandpaper do you just use? This is 150 what right here. You just use on his edge. 150. What's your what's your normal grit progression, Liz? I'll usually start with a used 80 grit belt because I use my husband's knife materials. <laughs> and so he keeps all of his used belts for me over in a corner. And I'll typically like if I'm just starting to like if I'm doing my initial sand to get everything lined up, I'll start with a used 80 and then I'll probably go to like a used 120 and then I finish it up with uh, like 240 or whatever it is that I have just by hand. Yeah. When I'm doing my finishing. I've heard of people going down to 600 and 1,000 yeah. grit. They got me know, a piece of 600. Which which you can use, but in a way you're doing a little bit of overkill there. You're you're kind of doing something that you... So you do you, show. but it may yeah. not be completely necessary. Right. But if, you know, if that's what you want to do. But even what I just did here, mm -hmm. this, is, this is just a regular sponge and, and just plain water. I'm going to take and... Just wet this edge. Now I'm going to take a piece of glycerin saddle soap. And then this is just a piece of canvas that I have rubbed with this saddle soap. Same, same glycerin saddle soap. Now I'm just going to rub it like this. If you can hear that, you know, it's, it's friction is what's actually doing the work. Mm -hmm. Now you can feel that. That's a pretty darn smooth, nice, nice edge. Yep. It's not a glass edge. No. Nope. But it's a pretty nice edge. What's it now look this, like on this game? I'm sorry. <clears throat> how do, how yeah, so that water, I mean, it just lays everything down. Water, And then water helps slick it out, too. So yep. it kind of helps meld all those fibers together. Yep. Now this is this is the side that I didn't sand. All I did was use the edger on it. And you probably won't be able to see a big difference, but I bet we can feel a difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you feel that one. There's a big difference there. Yeah. There's a big difference there. But... This is just medium yeah. weight canvas, guys. Yeah. Yeah, you could use an old pair of jeans. Yeah, yeah you, you can, can use, use denim. Jeans. You might have to worry about a little bit of color bleed if you're doing natural. Yeah, yeah. But I've seen people use like a, a brown paper bag to burnish it. Oh, really? And it works very well, yeah. A brown paper bag? Yeah. It doesn't shred? Just an old grocery shed. Well, you can't use it a hundred times. Sure. No. <laughs> but, but I mean... You can use that, and it will make a nice slick edge, probably slicker than this would. Be. Interesting. Yeah, try it. I will. You will. I'll do that. <laughs> All right. What else? Oh, I didn't say anything about uh, French edges yet. Oh, we were going to talk about uh, about uh, creasers. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about creasers right now. All right, I've burnished that edge. And it's a little bit damp. I'm going to dampen this whole thing. No. 
here's a set of creasers. I've got several different sizes and two different kinds. I've got a, a double-edged creaser here, which will make two lines on the leather. Ooh. And these are single-edged creasers, which are more common. I'm going to use this, this big one here because it'll kind of show. <clears throat> and mainly I use a creaser on a, on a piece of leather that's not going to be stitched, not going to have a stitched edge. Okay. But, but if you're real fancy, people like to put crease lines next to their stitch lines. I still have not gotten to that point, yeah. but I see it on a lot of things, and that is my next thing that I will try yeah. someday. Okay. I'm left-handed, so I'm going to use this creaser left-handed. Okay. Right-handers have a little bit easier time with a creaser because you actually want to push in against the edge mm -hmm. of this leather when you, when you crease it because it's going to do two things. One is going to make a nice line. A parallel line to the edge and another thing uh, the way this thing is built it's rounded on the inside is going to pack the edge of what you just did and make that to uh, that uh, burnish that you've already done even better mm -hmm. so I'm gonna use it left-handed oh just your hand is in front so we can't see it <laughs> still <laughs> Just flop back and forth again. There we go. But if, but now feel that edge and look at it. Yeah, that it just gives it, gives it a different look too. Mm -hmm. I, the, yeah, go. But it it makes it look like it's rounded over from that crease line all the way to, yep. the, to the edge there. But it will it will pack that edge, make the make the fibers stay laid down a lot better than if you just use the water in the saddle. So right. But now, since I did that, my final deal, I would I would go back over this with just paste saddle soap. Go back over that edge. Like that. That'll smooth it down even more. Because even when you go over it, you can use that. You can use and that. then you can slick it down. <laughs> you can slick it down. Any kind of a tool that you've got and that you want to use. You know, the main thing is friction is is what's going to make yeah. that edge nice. Didn't even brought time. in the, yeah. the little Marvin tool. Yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah. I would say that would help you burnish your edge. You have to hold yeah. it up. Yeah. You guys remember Marvin brought his? Yeah, Marvin Nolte. Yeah. And he brought this tool in and used it. I had seen these tools before, but when he brought his in and he was using it, I thought, why don't I make one of those and use it? <laughs> and it makes things, a lot of things like belts. It yeah, makes it you have so to like, much try to like easier. Pinch it and hold it yeah. up and it's inconvenient. And this just yeah. gives you a really nice spot to work with. Yeah. Now, when you're doing, when you're doing your edges, do you usually just water and saddle soap them? Or do you then follow it up with gum trag? I don't use gum trag for the most part. Okay. I I use the saddle soap and water, mm -hmm. and uh, then if if I crease it like I just did, then I'll go back over it with that paste saddle soap, and then after I've oiled and done whatever sort of a, a color finish that I'm going to do, I will quick shine that edge, and that will also make make that edge stay slick down, nice yeah. and smooth. See, typically I will I'll do the the water and saddle soap. Or yeah, the glycerin saddle soap. But then I'll go back over with gum trag after that's dried, and I'll just I just kind of gum trag my whole project. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but all your color work is done before that. Right? Yes, yeah, that's the last thing that I'm doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. If you're using something like the gum trag or token all or toco pro mm -hmm. or something that have everything else done. That's because yeah. It's going to put you're a not going to do it afterwards. Yeah, it's going to put a sealer coat on your leather and keep but it. But use that crease when you made that line on there. <clears throat> that makes a pretty good stitch line there, too. Yeah, you can use that to stitch in. But myself, if I wanted to stitch a, a, an embedded stitch line, I would use a stitch groover. That it actually cuts the leather out. Yeah, because, yeah, because that way it would actually let your stitches lay down in below the surface of the leather but mm -hmm. but what you've done here on yours yeah that's nice that's very nice because you can tell that you've pulled that those stitches down in there nice and tight yeah and i don't i don't groove 
when when I do it, um, I will just I well I mean I'm hand sewing, so I I will mark with a wing divider where my stitch line is, and then I go in with a chisel and I chisel out the top layers. So I'll take um, my top layer and my welt, and those are glued up, and I will chisel with my uh, my stitching chisel as far through as I can get, and then I glue everything up, and then I take my awl and I'll go through, and it does it pulls it up pretty pretty nicely. That's sure a pretty stitch line. I I could have sworn it was a machine stitch myself. Other than the bottom looks as nice as the top. Because <laughs> when you machine stitch the bottom, I don't think I could get a machine to do this. I've tried, but machines freak me out. I will not. <laughs> I will not test my sheath in a machine. I have blown out the welt too many times, or just you know, like it wants to fall off, or it's not coming. It scares me. I've already got like 20 hours in it by the time I sit down in a sewing machine and I'm not about to mess it up. <laughs> I don't use them enough. And that's just my fault. Yeah. I remember when I used to, when I was building saddles and I would have a saddle skirt, all full tooled and everything. I had however many hours in it. My knees would just shake when I walked up to the machine. I know. <laughs> You're just like, oh, please don't, don't yeah. go badly. Yeah. Okay. What else are we doing here? Okay, let's talk about uh, an oil tan leather or or a chrome tan leather. Okay. I had two pieces here, yeah. And if you're going to try and, and uh, burnish and finish an edge on a piece of a chrome tan or oil tan leather, the water and saddle soap method will not do you very much good. Okay. Oh, yes, that's because the chrome tan won't really soak up the water. Yeah. It's not yeah, doing anything. The water is not going to help you any. So the gum drag is a, is a pretty good finish on that type of leather or Tokenol or Toco Pro. Mm -hmm. yep. Any of those type. They p actually paste the leather down. Yeah. Are you getting ready to? I am. I was going to bevel this real fast because okay. I think I'm, I think I'm good on my. All right. Standing. I'll bevel this. And I'm going to use, I would say, number one beveler on this. And I'm going to bevel this piece too. This is an oil tan here. This brown one is an oil tan, and this is just a chrome tan leather. This, other, this is what we made those bags out of for the last month. <laughs> <laughs> Two months. All the pink bags. Yeah. But you can you can do the same sanding process if you want to with this stuff. You know, to get your edges nice and uh, get as much of the fur off as you want to. On this one, I'll use, I'm going to use Toco Pro. And a piece of canvas. And I'm not going to put that saddle soap on this canvas, although it probably doesn't matter. And I'm just... Okay. Um, he said, where does the push beveler fall into the spectrum of bevelers? And if one oh, is doing that, a shared in style tooling, would you want to use a steep angle push beveler? Oh, well, that's a little different than what we're talking about yeah. right now. So, that, Michael, that's beveling your tooling, and we're yeah. talking about beveling your edges. Yeah. But a, a push beveler, it, it works, but you won't get a lot of definition out of it. Kind of like a... Like a cheat beveler? Yeah, it's a it's a cheater. Yeah, a lot of people <laughs> like it's hate, not bad. It's just... a lot of people just hate beveling those long borders, like on a belt or mm -hmm. or anything. You know, the the border is generally the longest line you've got to bevel, so they'll use it on that. But but still, you don't get as much definition out of that. And as far as for the Sheridan style bevelers, yeah, you do want a steep beveler, not necessarily extra steep, but a steep. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I'm just going to use my finger and dip it in this Toco Pro. Using your creaser, you do that after you have beveled the edge? 
Yes, yes. Bevel your edge, and then I always I always burnish it with the with the water and glycerin saddle soap, and then I make sure the whole the whole surface of that leather is is wet, and then I will go over it with the with the creaser. Now, um, Al, I think Denny's going to go over sharpening or stropping his bevelers here in a little bit, so yeah. we'll, we'll get there. Yeah. That Toco Pro makes a pretty nice edge. Mm-hmm. You know, and I sanded that a little bit also. But there again, friction, this... This Toco Pro or whatever you do use is important, but the main thing is, is put a lot of friction to it. Actually get the edge hot. Yeah. So it kind of melts in yeah. that that chemical. Yeah. yeah. If you just rub it kind of haphazardly, it's not going to do very much for right. you. Right. But uh, now, let's see. Let's do this uh, piece of Which is why, part. like, that was one of the things I really liked about Marvin and his little mitts. Because you don't have to worry about holding on to the canvas. Like you can just like it's just in your hand and it's yeah. not going anywhere, which was What's the edge of that pink thing look like close up? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now you can see the red in between those two layers mm -hmm. because this this leather is not struck through. struck through. Yeah. But each each side of the leather is dyed that color. Yeah. So what you're seeing on the center is the inside of both of those pieces. So if you wanted to, before you glued it together, if you wanted the edge just to be solid, like the, the crust color, you could sky down that edge on the inside you of could. if you wanted to. You or could. you could color it before yeah, you... Yeah, you could color it. You usually, you well, which is really why all of your edge coats exist. Like, when it comes to veg tan, like, dyeing your edge is usually sufficient, you know, you'll kind of get more color penetration when you dye your edge as opposed to laying on a layer of edge coat. Um, but all of your edge paints, like the Fenici edge paints and the edge coats, sit on the top. Um, and that's, you know, for your chrome tan leathers, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for a coat of color, like a paint that's going to sit on the top. Um, so most of the time, like your Fenici edges, like that's it's for chrome tan leathers because you typically will have this situation and they don't take dyes like yeah. suit like they you it's it's difficult to dye them. Well, even talking to Clayton about it, we you would still finish your edge like that and get set your edge up to receive that paint, mm -hmm. just like we've been doing, just like you've been doing, and then paint to give it a good surface yeah. to lay on. Yeah, because otherwise the paint is going to be awkward and it's going to like sit in all those fibers and it's not going to be smooth. So people they always call up and they're like, "I want that really smooth like handbag from." Italy yeah. look and that's a lot of coats of uh, like thin sand coats, your coats and sand between your coats yeah. with like 600 grit sandpaper yeah. to get that really high shine edge like it is not a quick process to yeah. get that most people want something you can put on there and it when it dries it's like that that's like three or yeah. four coats later yeah yeah anyway on this other this piece of oil tan I'm going to use this token all and it's just a different uh Product about the same thing as our Toco Pro. It does the same thing. I do love a good, like, my first layer of water, and then I'll take my 600 grit sandpaper after my, like, I just wet the edge, and it already just feels so good. <laughs> awesome, I had a question there. Uh, if you're going for perfection on chrome tan burnish, would a heated edge creaser be able to melt? The fibers? No. I don't know that we have an answer to it because none of us in here use a heated yeah, creaser. Yeah, I don't think you're ever going to melt. You, you're you're going to need to paint them. So you can crease the edge. Like, I've seen a lot of people, um, like that Peter um, Nintz, like when he makes his handbags um, on Instagram, he actually puts out a lot of pretty educational material. So if you're looking for, like, tips and tricks with chrome tan leather, that would be a good place to start. I mean, he's making... Like ten, twenty thousand dollar handbags out of like American Gator, and they're spectacular. Um, so he puts a lot of time into them, but he kind of will lay out the the basics of doing it, and you can heat crease it, but then you're painting that edge. Yeah. 
I, to get that look. I just have one interjection about the heat deal. Mm-hmm. If you use too much heat on the leather, it will actually kill the fibers. It will, it will, it will burn the fibers of the leather. And especially on an edge, it seems to me like over a time when you bend that edge back and forth, eventually it will check and crack and break right there. Okay. So when you do heat, I mean, they do make machines. They are not cheap. Like those heated creaser machines, those electric ones that you can buy, they're like four or 500 bucks for one of those machines. Um, But you're saying like if you were to take one of your creasers and just kind of like heat it up on something, (laughs) be careful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all I know is... These old cowboys used to brand the fenders on their saddles. Oh, you know, really? With their, with their yeah. brand. And it would break the leather there. After a year, the leather would crack right there where they'd branded it, mm-hmm. you know. Nice job, Tony. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Well, consummates at six hundred dollars with tips. Yeah, I've looked into them before because I was like, "Oh, that would be a neat thing to have." But then I'm like, "No, nah, I'm good." Well, not that neat. It's not that neat. I'm not there yet. Maybe Chris can craft you one. <laughs> Smith you up a creaser. <laughs> I don't think that's going to be my first ask, but no, no, okay. probably not. Ooh, are we gonna? Are yeah, we gonna... let's talk about sharpening your your okay. edgers a little bit. All right. Now, a small edger like this, number one, 127 that we have here, is going to be very hard to sharpen on oh, anything like this. That is tiny. Good gracious. That's for a now, really fine a, wallet this is a part. Size, this is an odd size zero. Guys, look at this thing. This is the teeniest. Look! Look how little that is. Like, if you have a one and a half ounce piece of leather, you might be able to. Well, it's about like, it's about like our uh, pro. Mm Mm-hmm. I suppose. You know, but it will. He's a whittle. Yeah. Just a whittle. Oh, he's just a whittle guy. Yeah. (laughs) But something like this, this small, you will need to get yourself a piece of uh, cord string of some sort, Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, either rub some. I use a... Two different grits. This is this is an emery cake, which you can get at most hardware stores. Most, please, please most, don't eat it. Yeah, don't eat this stuff. It's not all that good. Not a cupcake. Yeah, it'll wear <laughs> your teeth down really quick. <laughs> but this this has a little bit of grit to it, uh, and this is uh, just jeweler's rouge that uh, that we sell to that you strop your knives on. But uh, but you will need a piece of string and put some of this emery cake. On it, just just rub it on there. We had an old recorded video where we, Clayton talked about that. It no, was Denny, the, it was in the other studio, but then you did it again. Yeah, we have a whole like sharpening. two hour video on like sharpening all of your tools yeah. and strapping everything. And then I think on the natural harness belt that we did, Clayton he doesn't explain it, but he shows pulling the string through the yeah edge beveling. Yeah, and that's that that works really well. Uh, a small beveler, though, just be very careful with it. Don't don't ever bevel anything other than leather, yeah. you know, because they're hard to keep sharp. Denny, is that is that just one of your old tools, that little teeny one? Yeah, I don't think we even we even stock a, a size out in this in this style. Okay, but okay. it's an oil old, probably a Tandy beveler that I got years and years. Does it even have any markings on it? No, no. The only we have got it a size out in the. It could be it could be a, an Osborne. I'm not sure. Yeah, we don't. because it is old. It is old. Okay, but when you get into your larger style, larger size bevelers like this, here's a number three. I've got a little board here that I made. This got some pieces of leather on it. Uh, the thinnest piece of leather has has some of this emery cake, and the thicker one has the uh, has the jeweler's rouge. But I'll just take and draw my beveler down that edge on the emery cake first. Then I'll take and I'll go to the jeweler's rouge. And most people 
when you first start out doing this, you think, oh, now that can't help that much. <laughs> but if you've been using a beveler that won't cut, and after mm-hmm. you do this, you will praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Or maybe just your makes, sharpening it setup. It makes such a difference, you know, just to strop something. Another thing you can do if you've got a, a, a strop board, I've got a strop board here with the emery cake on one side and the jeweler's rouge on the other side. Mm-hmm. I'll just take and use the edge of this board and draw my beveler down that edge. Did you already talk about how important it is that you only go the one way? Uh, no, I didn't. <laughs> That is fairly important on a, on a strop board. Just just go away from your edge, not towards your edge. <laughs> never, never strop. Yeah, because the you way would, that you would bevel. Yeah, you would bevel your strop board if you did that. Does that mean on the little circle one? There's really not a good way to strop it. Little circle. One. The, the, oh, you, you have to be very careful. Uh, the reason I don't use one of those very often is because when I sharpen it. I will make one side really sharp and the other side really dull. <laughs> it's hard to keep from yeah. making one side dull when you're trying to make the other side sharp. Yeah. For me, it is anyway. So I don't have much experience that I can draw on as far as how to sharpen. Consummate nerd said, wait, bicycles. you can sharpen these? <laughs> what? It's a whole new world out there. Yeah. Yeah. But... Uh, Using using both of these, the emery cake is pretty important, and then the jeweler's rouge is the most important because that polishes that edge. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else have we got that we're going to talk about? So we creased. Oh, well, I mean, there's the products. What's that other little bag of things? Oh, that's the French edgers. Okay. Why don't you talk about those before we start yeah. playing with products? And French edgers aren't really used to... Uh, to Bevel an edge. They call them a French beveler, though, don't they? Yeah, what I think do they, they call them. I think they do. Oh, I don't see them in the catalog. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, we have them over here with the skyvers because they're they're skyvers. Yeah. So, oh, French, French edge, edge skyver. skyver. Okay, so it's not really an edge beveler; it's an edge skyver. Oh, okay. And this, You're can good. you see what I'm doing? I'm actually, <laughs> tell me he's always so encouraging. Mm-hmm. Great job, Danny. Oh, I think your last shot was better. <laughs> there you go. My last shot was better. I, I was too far back. Oh, okay. No, she's talking to me. Yeah. And this is, this is just an old beveler. It's not a real expensive one. When I bought it, I know. But I've had this for years. Actually, a lot of your tools get better with age because you keep sharpening them and keep sharpening them, and you finally get them sharp. <laughs> <laughs> they finally get there. Yeah, that's now, what people say about me. <laughs> <laughs> you finally got sharp. <laughs> the more they're around me, the more they either can uh, just accept who I am <laughs> or get sharp about it. We're all still working on it. But, but this is another French. Beveler, yes. French edge beveler, French edge skyver. Okay, <laughs> most people would call it a French edge. I think so. Yeah, yeah. But it works the same way. It's just a smaller, narrower version. Yeah. So these are really good. So like, if you have a section, obviously Denny's thinning down the edge of something, and so that's really nice. So it's almost kind of like a little bell knife, like a handheld bell that's knife. Exactly what it does. Yeah, but you can also go into the leather. Yeah, you can bevel this whole piece. Mm-hmm. You can just start out in the middle and bevel this whole piece. And so, like, if you have, you know, if you're making a box and you need to fold something, like this is a really good tool to get that skived section so that you can make a fold. Or I used it to um, skive down my tabs. So I stole one of Denny's edgers this weekend, and these little tabs that went under the leather here, I skived my two edges to almost just a feather um, that went into the seam here. Um, and so there's bar- barely a lump. I mean, you can see them once I once I put my product on there. Like, it, it'll go away. You can still see a little bit of a bump. But, yeah, you can just use it, and it's just a nice yeah. a nice edging or skiving tool. Yeah. But as far as using it to, to fold an edge, this you can just... Just carve out some leather. Well, yeah. Use it like a gouge. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Michael Denny has done that, too. He'll use that if he has leather that's too thick and he's trying to set a snap. He'll put his hole in there. He'll skive around the hole to yeah. allow the snap to set down. To, yeah. So, look at that. Here's a hole here. Here's a hole. You got you got a snap. The, the shank is too short. Just wallow that hole out. So, waller it on out. <laughs> Denny likes to waller things out. Yeah, things get pretty badly wallered after I'm done with them. <laughs> That always happens. But you, but you make it thinner. It, do this on the unfinished side. <laughs> <laughs> Not like because you'll be did, able to see the outside. Well, <laughs> you're gonna have to need a bigger cap for your snap. Yeah, yeah. Just put a bezel on it. But I think we've about covered things. Chevy wants to know if you actually own any other tools. <clears throat> Me? Yeah, or you just borrow everybody else's. Um, I mean, I borrow Denny's a lot, but I do own, I do own several. I do. I've got a um, Crimson Hide is a brand that I found out of Singapore, um, and I have a set of their um, stitching chisels, and I like those quite a bit. I also have their stitching all. Yeah, I was gonna say you bought a really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's all I see you bring in. You're like, okay. I'm like, Jesus, no, I didn't say that about those tools. Oh. Um, but yeah, so those are kind of the two things that I've treated myself over the years to to that. Um, I mean, I have like the obligatory, like like mallets and hole punches and snap setters. And You've got a leather table. I yeah. I have a big cutting work. mat. Like I've got like a three by four cutting mat on my big rusty <laughs> found or whenever he moved out of his house, he had like this huge drafting table that he wanted to get rid of. And so I have that now, but it's a big, maybe three by five because my three by four mat is slightly smaller than the table. So I think it's like a three by five drafting table. I and so like what you're bra bragging about is actually the table that you do the leather work on. None of the tools. I mean, it's just the table. It's sturdy. That it was, a, was so it was freaking a, awesome. Listen, if you would have seen, so... I have a, like, my leather room is on the second floor of my house, and um, to get that table up the stairs, because, like, the legs didn't come off, it's got a built-in base, it's a metal, it's a heavy-duty table, like, it's a good one. And there are dings in my walls, and it almost, like, it was a good thing that there's a, a big window cut out in my room, so my room, my house is like a, like a split level, but then the living room is uh, floor to ceiling, like 17 foot high. And then you just have this cutout where the second story sits kind of like up to the right hand side. And so my room has this, like the wall that looks out down into the living room has this big window cut out, like probably the size of this table. There's this window in the wall that looks down into the living room. Is and there if, glass in it? No, it's just open. Just open. Yeah. So, you know, if you just, if I had like some sort of a, whatever. So anyway. <laughs> I could, yeah, parachute out my window. Um, and so, but if that window wasn't there, we wouldn't have been able to pivot the table into <laughs> the room. It went outside through it the window. It did. It went, the legs went through the window, and then we had to pivot it back into the room. Uh, it just wouldn't have worked otherwise. Good news, it took us an hour to get this far off track this week. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. Friday. Yeah, Friday we was. Okay, let's get off track a little more. Okay, Wait, what do you got? I, I now have a real driver's license. Did you did you have a fake one before? Like you, you were know, pretending well, to be 21? Well, no, I thought that I I went down and, you know, you, when you renew your test, your license, they just have you look in the thing to see if your eyes are all right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that, and they gave me a license, and I looked at it, and it said, this is not a real driver's license or this is not a real id yeah this is not a real id oh oh but now you have a real id yes for PSA after, purposes. but this so is now you painful can, you can fly it, without a passport yeah it's painful to get one of these because you have to provide like three proofs of yeah. like like that you live in your house right yeah that you live in your house you have to have your original social security card not laminated by the way Oh, you can't preserve it in lamination. No. You're not supposed to laminate them. Yeah, Does I it's... hate you. <laughs> Denny, did you laminate yours? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. I didn't tell you sooner. <laughs> is yours real? No. Uh, see. Oh, this yeah. is not good. But anyway, 
I got mine. Yeah, that was really a bad name for that. My wife was going to get hers. Uh huh. And uh, my wife had been divorced once, so we went down there, and they said, "Okay, you need your marriage license." You mean your divorce? Your, your certificate, your marriage certificate. And so she showed it. She she. We had to go get one because we couldn't find the original. Okay. So, so you had to we do got the whole it. courthouse shenanigans. Yeah. Okay. So we got that. And she had to do her social security card too. Because hers but, was also laminated. Yeah. So <laughs> we took it back and she, uh, she of course, she was going to use my name. And uh, they said, okay, uh, is so is this your maiden name? She said, no, that's my uh, my first marriage. My name to that. And they needed they her said, divorce. Okay, paper. we need... We need that marriage certificate, too. What? So, we got that. She had it. For some reason, she still had it. But we got it. By the time all was said and done, this has been a three-week process. You guys have all the paperwork you would ever need now, don't you? Oh, yeah. We could shoot. We could make nuclear weapons now. <laughs> you could probably buy a casket. <laughs> <laughs> but... <laughs> Yesterday, when we were getting hers, uh-huh. trying to finalize hers after we got all the stuff that we needed, we went to we went right up the street here to this one, and there was a line out the door. Oh, my gosh. It would have been like two hours before we got in. So she said, let's go to Republic. And you guys that aren't from here don't know. Republic is a minor yeah, in our But it's still area. 10 miles from here. Yeah. So we drove to Republic, and... Uh, they were closed. Oh, for no, sake. No, they were, uh, this was a day before yesterday. They were closed. Oh, because it was June Because 10th. I didn't realize it was a holiday. Mm-hmm, it's a new one. Yeah. So, it, the next day we went again, yesterday, and their line was out the door. So, she said, let's just go to Mount Vernon. I was going to take a uh, scenic drive. What else have we got to do? So, <laughs> we went to Mount Vernon, which is about 30 miles from here. And they were closed for renovation. Are you so we said, okay, we're already here. What do we do? So we went across the street and ate at a little Mexican restaurant, which was very good, by the way. Oh, yeah? Mount Vernon has the neatest old courthouse I've ever seen. Oh, really? It's like eight stories high, and it's got this huge uh, bronze statue on top. I mean, you look way up and can barely see the top. There's probably like 50 people that live in Mount Vernon. Yeah, (laughs) it's not a very big town. But anyway, after we ate, we said, okay, what are we going to do? And I had this bright idea. I said, let's "Let's try to Dublin. Let's go to Greenfield. What's Greenfield? Greenfield is the county seat of Dade County. Oh, how exciting. And it was just up the the road another 20 miles or so. What's the difference now? (laughs) So we went there, and finally, there was no one in that office other than the people that ran it. There were two of them just waiting to jump on someone. <laughs> so, so, insti- so, so instead of waiting two hours here, you just drove for two hours and got Oh, right yeah, in. we spent eight hours saving two hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But after we got to Greenfield, they said, yeah, and my wife said, now, I don't have my new Social Security card yet, but I we went and applied, and they said, that's fine. <laughs> they didn't even look at her. <laughs> They're like, we don't care what yeah. you have. It's fine. Yeah, it, it'll work. <laughs> well, you should always go to Greenfield. Yeah, fields. we're going to. For, for everything we do, from now on, we're going to Greenfield. <laughs> that's my story. <laughs> I, well, have, I have no more. Uh, the actual cost of a real ID is 90 gallons of gas. Yes, 90 gallons. <laughs> and a... Two weeks of your life. Yeah. Molly did have a question she about did. edging. After burnishing veg tan, uh, would you, uh, what would you do to color? Uh, anything you want, as long as you burnish with water and saddle soap. If you put any sort of a, like the gum trag or the tokenol or toco pro or something like that on it, you're done. <laughs> Yeah, so what I'm going to do now, so I have only put water on my edge, and I've used 600 grit sandpaper, and I've just kept smoothing. I've done two coats of water, and oh my goodness, Denny, just just touch it. Oh. It feels so good. It makes me want to go to sleep. <laughs> it's so smooth. So in any case, so once I'm here, so now I'm going to take, this is the dye, this is the Fenici dye, uh, chocolate brown that I use to dye all of my dark edges here, and the belt loop and all of that. 
So now I'm going to take this die with in the cup with a sponge and I'm going to paint the die onto my edges so that it matches everything else that I've done. Um, if you didn't want to do, you know, this specifically, you could use one of the edge coats to paint. But typically what I do is just whatever color dye I've been using to color my thing, I will then just use that for the edge. That's that's my standard. That's what I do. Wow. Uh, nice. She sewed it by hand. I did sew it by hand. Yeah, and it, she did a beautiful job, too. You guys I, take my word. For I it. probably have approximately 10 hours of hand sewing in this sheet. <laughs> Because I had to sew in all the inlays and the, maybe not quite 10, but I specifically, like, I started to hand sewing at 8.30 last night and I finished at 11.30 and that was just for the main stitch from here to here, this one. <laughs> but that's just a case in point about planning stuff, you know, planning what you had to stitch before you put everything together. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, you really got to, I sit there and I think about these for a really long time, like, like thinking about my method bef- like of getting this belt loop attached, I ended up what I did because the the back of this belt loop, like I needed to glue it in place before I put my lining, right? So like my lining housed all of this so that you can't see it on the inside. Um, but to sew this top edge while my belt loop was on would have been terrible. So what I did is I glued this this section, this this section up here. So I glued, let me, let me think about it. So I glued this section and then down the center, I glued that together and then like between my, between my slots. And then I sewed this top edge just right here and I left the string long enough that I could come around to here because it's open down there. And so then I sewed that up and then I put that in and then I finished gluing the rest of the back down because otherwise it would have just been awful to attempt to sew that while this was here. It was a lot of... But in the meantime, you also had to stitch in... Oh, yeah, this was completely done. Before, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this whole thing was assembled and so, done before... So you had to plan that before you planned the other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and then because I don't like to cut out my linings, like, completely until it's glued on so that I can trim everything together and make sure that everything is all done, what I had... In order to get these flaps, because then I wanted to skive the flaps down to where they were just paper thin. So I glued everything except for the flaps, and I left those loose, and then I cut these little, like, notches out, and then I just skived the leather down where I needed to skive it down, and then I glued it together after that so that it was all skived, but everything was together, and then I could trim afterwards. <laughs> Anyways. It's a process, you it's guys. A lot, yeah. It took about an hour to explain how you did it. It's a lot. <laughs> I, was falling I probably asleep. stared at it for an hour before I, was I did it. I taking a nap, but I didn't even rub your leather. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right, if you want to enjoy some more. Oh, what maybe people that enjoyed the last video, maybe they didn't know. Maybe they don't know what's happening, Benny. Uh, oh, the Elps, you know what's have, happening? the Elps have run through the studio. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody know Jim Linnell? Raise your hand. Anybody ever heard of Jim Linnell? Do we know, do we know Jim Linnell? Yes. Everybody out there? Anybody? Do we know and love Jim Linnell? World class, world famous. He's uh, coming to town. He's coming to Springfield Leather. He sure is. So the last week of July, we will have Jim Linnell in house here. Um, we are taking who's interested in possibly being available to come in for a class that Thursday. Um, the last, the last, whatever the last week of July is that Thursday, um, we hope to be offering a class with Jim Linnell here in house. It'll be somewhere like hundred, 150 bucks to take the class. Um, so if anybody out there is interested, we had a couple people send us some emails on Friday and if you did, thank you. We got them. We're just kind of keeping a list together. Um, but any of you guys that weren't here Friday or listening to this later, would you like to touch it? Um, <laughs> uh, well, and they want to see it close up. Oh, little fear wanted to see your sheet all close up. Wow, nice job on that edge. Doesn't that feel good? Um, that so send enough? send an email to live at springfieldleather.com. That will get to mm-hmm. myself and Tony, um, and we will begin to kind of put a list together of who is interested. We're probably looking for about uh, two dozen people or so for the class. But then just mark it on your calendars. Jim will be here with us for our live videos um, on Wednesday and Friday. Um, Still trying to decide yeah. if we're... That's if the cool part. If we're going to be um, streaming every day that week, maybe maybe on Twitch only. Uh, we're going to be shooting. We're going to carry seven of his patterns. Uh, so we're going to. Uh, what was the class? Do some videos. 
He was uh, going to go over different types of tooling methods, like styles, different types of tooling styles. Monday, Monday and Tuesday with him, we're going to be shooting videos for the patterns we're going to carry mm -hmm. for him. Thursday for the class is going to be regional tooling Style. styles. styles. Yeah. So it's going to be Sheridan, Porter, Northwest. He's going to talk about the history of all of them and the different the different techniques in all of them. It's going to be, I'm saying 8 to 5. Uh, with an hour lunch break, uh, 100 to 150 bucks, de depending on the location that we're able to use, and if Rusty cooks barbecue. That's right. All I'm saying is, if I wasn't already going to be here, I would come in here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be in Alaska. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, like this. Of course, that would be yes, how that works. Shucks. Yes, Holly, I did stitch through all of those layers. One stitch at a time. But I only had to do it for my last stitch because all the other ones are just stitched like through one or two, which goes a lot faster. Like that's that's not so bad. Man, this just guys, I wish I could I wish you could touch it. Alright, so here okay. here let me read Jim's regional carving styles, history and evolution. So I'm gonna switch microphones okay. so you can hear me. So this is the flyer that he has that says, what are some of the different regional styles that have influenced Western floral Western floral carving? And where did they come from? In the day of modern technology, Western floral carving has become somewhat homogenized to the point where the distinctness of the styles is beginning to fade. If you'd like to learn more about the history and heritage of Western floral carving, spend a day with Jim Linnell and Denny Lowe. While this history is being shared, students will be carving a design adapted from a saddle maker that was first started building saddles in Wyoming in 1868. He lists a name there, Frank Mania. Miana. This workshop is for the true student of the craft. So he lists on here the scheduled time for the workshop is 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then he lists where it was. It's one that he's done before. Um, so that is the flyer. We'll be putting it out soon uh, with him, and he'll be sharing it as well. We had a Luna treat. Yeah. Oh. I thought that she ate it right here. But she didn't. <clears throat> yes, Dean, another vacation for Liz. This is kind of the year of my vacations. I'm not complaining. <laughs> uh, Wayne, that is my maker's mark. My maker's mark is just a little lizard. So that's my... So that's my, that's my little lizard. It's a cool little mark, too. Isn't it cute? Victor says, live on cl online class where you just watch our free. I'd like to know some of <clears throat> the history. We are going to record it, and then we may put it on a DVD and release the DVD uh, for a price. I, I, but I can't comment. There there could possibly be some actual tooling involved, too. Can't, don't, or, or am I wrong? He, might, he might do some. In the class? Uh -huh. Yeah, the students that are there are going to be doing a tooling. Mm -hmm. Tooling for that that matches that Frank, what'd you say? Frank Miana. Miana. Miana, his style on one of the saddles that he did, one of his floral. So that's the plan for that. If you want to join us on Twitch, we'll be on Twitch uh, for the after party for a what little bit. You? Otherwise, we'll be back tomorrow, live shopping, Friday. Trading cards! Trading cards. Oh, yeah. Yep. Me and Kevin. Holly, I use a stitching chisel uh, from Crimson Hide, and then I go through the rest of the layers that don't make it with the, the, the stitching chisel uh, with just an all, a single blade all. Yeah. All righty, guys. Well, we'll see you tomorrow for live shopping, those of you that like to shop with us. And then Friday, we'll be back with Kevin and Denny for trading cards. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.